Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, the backstory, which might help you understand why this is peculiar talk, is the talk I'm giving, is that uh, about a year ago, the, our Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council rang me up and said, give us a talk about human-like computing. And I said, uh, why do you want to talk on human-like computing? Oh, we're thinking of having an initiative, and we realized we don't know what it is. Right. So uh, I gave a talk, which was, was titled this. What exactly is human-like computing like? Right. And what I'm going to do is give my very particular take on it. Um, there's no way that anyone, I think, would be able to give you an, a comprehensible overview of what we know about what human computing is like. Um, so, being devious person, I'm going to use this as an excuse for focusing very much on reasoning two interpretations. What you've just been doing by looking at somebody and uh, deciding what it is that they're, in this case, miming. Uh, versus reasoning from them. When we talk about reasoning, when psychologists of reasoning talk about reasoning, uh, they're usually talking about reasoning from an interpretation that has already been imposed on a bunch of data. Okay. And so what I'm suggesting is that uh, this element of the, the flexibility, the rapidity, the accuracy, people are absolutely brilliant at this. I mean, it's still very close to magic uh, that they can manage to do this. I mean, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, but it's, it's omnipresent. However, I'm a lover of paradox. And I realized as soon as I sat down and tried to think, what should I tell the EPSRC about this? Uh, there's a lovely paradox because the logic, the non-monotonic logic that we use for modeling this process in human reasoning, LP, I'm going to call it, actually pretty much invented, not alone, but very much just up the road from here in, in, in Imperial College, um, with a suitably cooperative semantics. So there are lots and lots of flavors of LP, but uh, we use a very particular one is a very good framework for studying this process of human interpretative reasoning, reasoning to an interpretation. Right? And that's a paradox because the people who invented it are in the computer science department. Right? They were in the business of making machines do things. They were not in the business of modeling what it is that people do. There's a programming language called Prolog, right? You, know, you lot know all about this, right? You know more about logic programming than I do. So, if we're right, if I'm right, that this is an important element, it's only one important element, but an important element in what's human-like about human computing, then the answer is that, well, it's because humans are just like computers in this very particular respect, right? The very first question, or one of the very first questions on the first day of the conference, uh, somebody stood up and said, well, it's obvious that hu the human brain is not a computer. So what is its memory like? And I would say that the, uh, I, I hope this talk is something of an answer to that in one very particular kind of human memory. And people tend to talk about memory as if it was homogeneous. Psychologists distinguish a lot of very distinct kinds of things which are different sorts of memory. So what we're looking at is human memory for general knowledge. It's probably the best way of thinking about it in a phrase. Right. Right. These capacities for interpretation are an important source of the flexibility of human computation. If you couldn't do this, you'd be absolutely lost. You could be a brilliant classical logician, probability theorist, or whatever you liked, but if you couldn't derive the interpretations that those systems require, 
uh, you'd be dead in the water. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean, fortunately, as far as we're human beings, unfortunately, as far as we're researchers, this goes on very largely inaccessibly to consciousness. We're not aware that we're doing anything. In fact, when you start teaching students, you spend considerable amount of time persuading them that they're doing any reasoning at all. I've got some silly examples, which will try and, I mean, I'm, you, you lot know all this stuff, right? But um, some silly examples to, to give you an idea of what I'm thinking about. But it's that ability to mobilize unpredictably relevant information from a huge, seriously huge memory uh, for regularities of general knowledge. That's the problem that I'm interested in. So, the plan of the talk, I, a tale of two logics. I'm going to contrast logic programming with classical logic. I mean, how many of you know all about logic programming? <laughs> Nobody's going to admit to knowing anything about logic programming. Who's, who's heard of logic programming? Come on. You're computer scientists, right? Right? Okay. So, um, one of the things I'll come to right at the end is it, this is not the flavor of the month, right? This is old hat. Right? It's unfashionable. Now we're into deep learning and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'm, going to, I'm, I'm actually interested in trying to get out of you some information about why it's uh, taken on this status. So narrative, stories. Child, think of children's stories. We, we work with very simple material most, most of the time, which turns out to be very complex. Right, that's the prime example of logic programming. But logic programming is not limited, it's not language processing, it's discourse. Above all, it's discourse. And you can have completely non-linguistic versions of discourse like the mime that we had when we came in. So when you're doing high-level vision, you're also doing this interpretative reasoning on the basis of your general knowledge about how heavy things are and how far away it's like that thing is likely to be, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I have a great deal of time of problems persuading psychologists that this is reasoning at all. Right? I mean, I think you lot probably have no trouble at all in understanding that this is reasoning, because it's so damn hard to get a computer to do it. Um, but that's the status in... Thing. It's not, I mean, the study of, lots of study of language narrative in psychology, but it's not regarded as reasoning. And they don't think about what logical framework it goes on in. Um, so it's a relationship between these two logics. A very important moral of the program I won't focus on very much today is that there's got to be a lot of logics involved in human cognition. Over and over again, I hear outside of logic, I hear people saying, what's the logic of human reasoning? Right? And you have these, mono I mean, you have fashions, right? We heard about cloud computing, and logic programming, yesterday's things, and now we have deep learning and so on and so forth. Right? The, the fashions where I come from are fashions about which framework, which formal framework, for many years, people studied classical logic as the Ur example of human reasoning. Now, it's all probability. I'm actually deeply skeptical as prob of probability as a model for this kind of reasoning. It's pretty much impossible combinatorics. Um, but one needs to think, start thinking about relations of logic. There is no logic of human reasoning because there are lots of logics of human reasoning. Not necessarily all logics, uh, but lots. Um, and this is the end of the talk. Many computer scientists would claim that LP is no good for AI. And I, I have to, I mean, I, I, I can do nothing but agree with them. I mean, they know, they tried. I'm very interested in why it failed. That's assuming that it, assume that it failed for the moment. Um, I want to talk about scaling, what happens when you scale. 
OK. Um, logic programming and classical logic are different, right? One's non-monotonic and the other's monotonic. Very common habit in computer science is to think of that in terms of the non-monotonic logic being a poor man's way of doing the real thing, which is classical logic. Right? It's uncertain reasoning, reasoning in uncertainty. I don't think people ever reason not in uncertainty. In classical logic, you're uncertain about whether the thing's a theorem. You have to prove it. Right? So there are lots of kinds of uncertainty, qualitatively different kinds of uncertainty, and the usual axiom, if it's uncertainty, then it's probability, I, th I absolutely reject. Right? I think there are forms of certainty involved in non-monotonic reasoning. In, in this case, we're talking about certainty of communication. Right? Certainty that a particular, inter a particular preferred model for a discourse is what the, in the speaker intended. Um, right, so you all know what default conditionals look like. Right? P and not AB implies Q, where AB is an abnormality clause. In this case, it's a disjunction of defeaters, abnormalities, things that mean that the inference doesn't go through. So if you press the car's brake pedal, the, bro the car slows down. We press, the we press the brake pedal, the car didn't slow down. How could you explain that? You have a list of defeaters, not a f maybe not a fixed list. A list is a very simple way of thinking about it. But you might say, oh, well, there's ice on the road. Right? Press the brake pedal and the car doesn't slow down. Do you give up the conditional? No. Do you give up your brakes? No. Right? It's an abnormality. And this kind of reasoning is, in a sense, jumping to conclusions. That's the thing that gives it this flavor of poor man's classical logic. But what's important about it for us is this preferred model semantics. So you get a preferred minimal model at every step in a propositional uh, LP system. Um, and the concept of validity is, is sorry, it, the concept of validity in classical logic is absence of counterexamples in all interpretations. Right? In LP, it's truth in the preferred model. Those are radically different, and it's not a matter of degree. OK, so LP has a knowledge base, KB, of general knowledge, conditional rules. You know this stuff, right? They're, they all look like that in form. Right? And closed world reasoning, which is, again, absolutely crucial. You're always, in this version of LP, you're always processing rel relative to a preferred model. So the situation we're thinking about when we model human reasoning is sentences coming in, in a discourse, a story, you were telling our four-year-old bedtime stories. I, I like really simple stories because they're very complicated once you start trying to take them to pieces. Uh, and closed world reasoning means that we assume that if we don't have any evidence to the contrary, then there aren't any abnormalities. So we draw the inferences. And that's the all-important thing. So you wind up, that's why you wind up with a preferred model, not as in classical logic, usually infinitely many models, of even very simple things. Um, that I just said. All right, so, so the jargon, the, the psychological jargon, is that we're looking at semantic memory. It's memory for general, semantic memory is a very odd name for it, but it's the general knowledge that's encoded in the knowledge base, and working memory is the construction of the preferred model that we've got for the current discourse. So the distinction between current 
input and stored general knowledge is absolutely crucial to this, this model of using LP as a, as a model of human memory. Propositional is a little bit complicated. I'm not going to go into the, t I mean, it, it, this logic is universally quantified uh, throughout. So we're talking about horn clauses. Um, but the propositional case, it, 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 basically, if you don't have any existential quantifiers, then LP is neurally implementable. That's very bizarre for a logic, right? All our understanding of unimplementability incomputability came from the study of classical logic. Classical logic is just, I mean, the three sat is the, is the complexity measure, right? Classical logic is hopelessly uh, difficult to compute because you're talking about potentially infinitely many models, right? Here you're talking about a single model and it's just about as efficient as can be. So, what psychologists refer to as spreading activation is an automatic reasoning process that doesn't require supervision in any way. And this is why we can use this for modeling things that go on in your brain that don't go on in the accessible part of your mind. Right? Because we can be sure that our feedforward network will deliver a unique preferred model at every step. Um, and finally, just to, I mean, the, the, psych the psychology comes down to asking, well, you know, can we find LP? Well, the most concrete evidence is from experiments on subjects processing human discourse and looking for where the defaults fire, where the abnormality conditions come into play. Right? So we can make up a story where you expect something to happen but it doesn't, something contradictory happens, you've got evidence that there's an abnormality, and you can pick that up in the, in the EEG signal. So, I mean, that doesn't prove that it's logic programming exactly, but it does go a long way to saying that there's good evidence for real-time existence of something like this process of defaults firing. So Judith Pinaka in the Max Planck in Nijmegen in, in Holland uh, has, and her collaborators have done uh, some very interesting experiments on with Peter Haggard as the senior guy behind. So these guys know what they're doing with electrophysiology. I wouldn't know, but they know. Okay, let me give you an ex a, a terribly simple example because it, so far it's all been very abstract and I want to be sure that you're clued into the, at least the paradigm sort of application that one's thinking about. John pushed him and Max fell are two sentences of English. This is nothing specific to English. This will go for any, I confidently assert for any natural language, this distinction, any natural language. All right? You have sentences. These are part of the structure of the language where what linguists spend most of their time focusing on. What is the syntactic structure of the sentence? What is the phonological structure of the sentence? I'm interested in language in use, when people are doing stuff with it, as psychologists in general should be. Max John, F sorry, Max Fell, John pushed him, is a very short discourse. Right? These two things are said together. First, the one is said, and in the context that the first one has been said, the second one is said. Right? That's discourse. And as we'll see in a minute, it can continue. Right? Why do we choose this particular example? Well, it's about the shortest example you can construct of an inference that you're making. I confidently assert that you inferred that it was John's push that caused Max's falling. And unusually, it's not the default order, right? The default order would have been to say, John pushed Max, Max fell, because we, there's a human convention of using time in and making it match the sequence in the discourse, unless there's some reason for not doing so. 
So it's a, it's a slightly uh, divergent, not difficult. I mean, I don't think you knew that you made a, an inference, right? Maybe if there's anybody who does natural language processing, they knew already. But it, that's the kind of inference that goes on well below accessibility, but it's crucial. If you don't make that inference, then you don't get the model. Right? You've made all sorts of inferences. You've inferred that Max is not John. There's no particular reason why it shouldn't be. Second names and all that. Right? But it would be a bizarre way of telling a story. Right? So, we get a unique minimal model for those two sentences. And our brain, I hate the distinct, I mean, talking about brains and minds, but just as a silly distinction for the morning, our brain has done something for our mind that we're, generally speaking, not aware of doing it. Doing. Now, the story goes on, right? A few stories are just two sentences long. The next thing we see is Max and John with two pet goldfish in a bowl. <laughs> I see some smirks up here on the screen. Right? This is not what you were expecting. You defaulted to the idea that Max and John were male human beings, probably. Right? Now, what I'm interested in is what happens with this. It's wildly improbable, right? Calculating its probability will tell you nothing cognitively, or very little cognitively, about what's going on. It's a perfectly acceptable continuation of the story. You may say this story's a bit weird, right? But so people tell weird stories all the time. Weird stories are more interesting than, than um, vanilla ones. But there's a problem. Can anybody tell me what is the problem that we've hit? Right, I mean, there's, there's problems connecting it up, but there's a much simpler problem than that. I mean, there's... Yeah, right. How do you fall in water if you're a goldfish? If it's the same max. If it's the same max, yeah, right, okay. But the default logic, the default logic has made sure that it's the same max, right? I mean, in classical logic, that's exactly the issue, right? A and B, but are A and B the same? You don't know in classical logic, right? I mean, so, but yes, the, 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 the crucial thing that I'm after is this falling. How does a goldfish fall in water, for God's sake? Right, it was very straightforward with human beings. We know what, what a human being falling is like. I mean, it's hundreds of different sorts of things, but it's, there's no difficulty about it. We fall over. Toddlers fall over all the time, the aged fall over all the time, and the people in between try not to, but they still fail sometimes. Right? But if you're a goldfish, it's a real problem. Right? So the next continuation of the same sentence right, is Max and John are floating in their bowl at the lip of Niagara Falls. Again, the probability is even lower. Right? But it resolves the problem about how if Max, if John pushed, I, I, get it, I still get it wrong. <laughs> if John pushed Max out of the bowl, then you can understand, if you know what, anything about Niagara Falls, that there might be some falling soon to be involved. Right? So, it's a silly example, right? It's intended as a silly example, but it shows you that you access these problems. I mean, you, if you're not a, in, in, a, in an academic talk, you pick up this problem that goldfish can't fall in water almost immediately, and you may resolve it. I mean, 
the, the, the second part of the sentence resolves it. You may not even notice this default firing in your ERP, right? because it's immediately resolved. Right. So, uh, Michiel van Lambalgen is my longtime collaborator. All this is joint work. Um, but he wrote a book with Fritz Hahn called The Proper Treatment of Events. So, Michiel is a logician and a probabilist. And they wrote a book about the formal semantics of analyzing human discourse in logic programming, constraint logic programming, that's proper logic programming. Um, and that's the problem. This, is, this event business is the problem that they were, in a sense, showing that you can solve for, by, for formal semantics. Um, right, so narrative is a major category of human reasoning, not thought of as that by the people who study. There's a field called the psychology of reasoning. They don't study this stuff. They don't regard that as reasoning. Oh, that's just language, apart from the fact that it's not language necessarily. We can do mime. Um, right, if you can't get a... There, there were, I mean, this was the problem that the cognitive revolution threw up as one of the major problems, right? How do people mobilize their general knowledge? And there were lots of demonstrations that they do. So, Bransford and Johnson is a very famous trick paragraph which has no complicated words in it, no complicated ideas in it, but you absolutely can't understand it until you see the picture about how the things fit together at which point it becomes immediately processable. If you can't get a preferred model, you're sunk. You can't do anything. Right. Right. Anecdotes. Anecdotes are little stories, right? We accuse people of reasoning anecdotally, right? But they do it all the time. It's usually a pejorative term, right? You're supposed to do it in, in logic, not, in, not in by telling stories. But there's a positive aspect that you see once you distinguish a logic for the anecdotes, and that is that these anecdotes are what produces the, what you have to do to start to get a statistical model or a classical logical model. So this is my dig at the Secretary of State for Health, the UK Secretary of State for Health, um, who bases a whole bunch of very important uh, policy decisions on what's called the weekend effect. Anybody heard of the weekend effect? The weekend effect is a regular, uh, the following regularity, sorry, right? If you're admitted to hospital at a weekend, then you're more likely to die than if you're admitted on a weekday. And this is not just UK, but it's certainly true in the UK, right? And we can tell stories like this. This is the kind of story that the tabloid newspapers love, and Jeremy Hunt, who's the Secretary of, of, of State for Health. Fred went to emergency on Saturday, and the hospital was understaffed. He died on Sunday. Right? You've in introduced all sorts of assumptions about the causal relationships. Right? He died because he was neglected on a trolley or whatever. Right? I mean, these are the these are the things. Right? And Jeremy Hunt claims that the NHS ought to be open seven days a week, open in the sense of open the same way as it is Monday to Friday. Right? Because and that would cripple the system even more than it's crippled at the moment because they've been crippling it. I mean, I would claim the whole reason for the seven day a week is that they're trying to cripple it, right? So we have this, this inference on based on a story. I mean, I don't think Jeremy Hunt believes his story. I doubt it, but uh, still. Right? There's an alternative story. 
Fred went to his GP and was scheduled for an operation on a Friday, right? and he was out again on Saturday. Right? That tells about another set of causal relationships that you pull in uh, in processing the discourse. Right? The Royal College of Physicians, who know about this stuff, unlike the politicians, reckons that the weekend effect is a sampling artifact. You only get admitted to hospital on a weekend if you're seriously sick. Right? I mean, on a f you may have ingrowing toenails, you might get, you probably wouldn't get admitted at all, but you might get admitted by, through a GP during the week. Right? It's just a sampling artifact. And there's a, turns out, an empirical literature showing that indeed it is. I mean, it's very hard to say, to show that there isn't any other effect going on other than the sampling effect. So that's why we have social scientists and medical epidemiologists and whatnot who do the difficult business of trying to show that there's that's the whole of the weekend effect, so I don't claim to argue. But it's this relationship between telling stories and making arguments by telling stories that is so omnipresent. And again, is another evidence that this, we achieve reasoning by narrative, sometimes bad reasoning, sometimes good reasoning, but we achieve it by narrative. Um, how am I doing for time? Out of time. If you want a question, I should wrap it up now. Wrap it up now, right. Okay. Um, right. A century of research into the psychology of reasoning has claimed to show that uh, humans are extraordinarily bad at classical reasoning. You give them syllogisms, for example, or waste and selection task, you might have heard about a very famous task. And they reason in obviously non-classical ways. And it's assumed in that literature until about the turn of this century that that was because they were trying to do classical logic and failing miserably. All right. More recently, Michiel and I set out to demonstrate, sorry, I mean, what we showed first of all was that if you take the classical laboratory experiments, you can show that the subjects are not trying to do classical logic. There's no reason why they should. They've actually been selected for supposedly not knowing what it is by name. Um, so you can show that the experiments are flawed by not understanding the interpretation that the subject has imposed on the task. Right? It's a serious accusation. More recently, Achuriotti um, uh, et al. have showed that you can take logically naive subjects, never took a logic course, is all that means usually, right? And you can get them to exhibit some of the fundamental paradoxes of classical reasoning by putting them in a dispute. And I'll end with a, with a dispute. Right? Um, enter Harry the snake. Who's Harry the snake? Well, does he sound like a nice cuddly character? No. He's a gangster of some sort. Right? Right? And he's down the casino taking bets on syllogisms. Right. Harry claims all the plumbers are academics, some of the plumbers are not frightened of water, so some of those frightened, some of those frightened of water are not academics. Right. This is not the material that we actually use with the subject. I thought we'd get a, try and get a giggle out of it. Um, and to cut a long story short, the subjects are asked, okay, do you want to bet against Harry? You don't want to bet against Harry if he's if it's a valid inference that he's offering, right? But if it's invalid, you choose whether to bet, and if you bet, you have to produce a counterexample. So that's, in technical terms, a model which makes the premises true and the conclusion false. And the famous paradoxes of material implication which are, have been studied for a century and a fifth now by logicians 
are exactly this pattern of reasoning. They require a pattern of reasoning where if the antecedent of a conditional is empty, the conditional is automatically true. And you can see this counterexample, which is typical of what subjects produce in this situation, is exactly like that. It's the not P makes all P are A true. Right? There's only one thing in this domain, and it's not P, so it's true that if, it, if there's a P, then, the, then there's a Q. Sorry, not a Q, an F. Right? So people can use the quirks of, they know a lot about classical logic, but they only know when they know they're in a dispute. If you meet Harry, you know you're in a dispute. He's trying to empty your wallet. Right. Yeah. right. Okay, sorry. I didn't leave enough time for looking at the computer science, but what I, I'm really interested in is why LP has such a bad reputation for scaling up. The meta-logic tells us that it should scale up, and I value people's experience of trying to fit it to real-world data. I think I know some of the things that are going on, so there's a possibly nice collaboration between cognitive scientists and computer scientists to be had in trying to figure out, although the logic scales up, why does it not, why, what are the other problems in dealing with large memories? Yeah.